is um, the next chunk of uh, next uh, group of topics in uh, 6033 called fault tolerance. And the goal here is to learn how to build uh, reliable systems. Um, in the extreme case, or at least our ideal goal is to try to build systems that will never fail. Um, and what we'll find is that we really can't do that, but what we'll try to do is to build systems which maybe fail less than, uh, less often than if you built them without the principles that we're going to talk about. So the idea is how to build reliable systems. So in order to understand how to build reliable systems, we need to understand what makes systems unreliable. And that has to do with understanding what faults are, you know, what, um, what problems occur in systems that cause systems um, to fail. And you've actually seen many examples of faults already. Uh, informally, a fault is just some kind of a flaw or an error or a, or a mistake that causes a component or a module not to perform the way it's supposed to perform. And we'll formalize this notion a little bit today as we go along. So there are many examples of faults, several of which you've already seen. A system could fail because it has a software fault, you know, a bug in a piece of software, so even when you run it, um, it doesn't work according to the way you expect, and that causes um, something bad to happen. You might have hardware faults. You store some data on a disk, you go back and read it, and it isn't there, or it's been corrupted. Uh, that's an example of a fault that might cause bad things to happen if you build a system that relies on a disk storing data um, uh, persistently. Uh, you might have design faults, where a design fault might be something where you um, tr try to, let's say, figure out how much uh, buffering to put into a, a network switch, and you put in too little buffering. So what ends up happening is too many packets get dropped. So you might actually just have a bad, um, you know, some bad logic in there, and that causes you to design something uh, that isn't quite um, going to work out. And you might, of course, have implementation faults where you have a design and then you implement it and you've made a mistake in how it's implemented, and that could cause um, faults as well. And another example of a kind of fault is an operational fault, um, sometimes called a human error, where a user actually does something that you didn't anticipate or was told not to do, and that caused um, bad things to happen. Now, for all of these faults, there are really two categories of faults, regardless of you know, what kind of fault it is. Um, the first category of faults are latent faults. So an example of a latent fault is, um, you know, let's say that you have a bug in, in, a, in a program where instead of uh, you know, testing if A less than B, you test if A greater than B. So that's a, that's a bug in a program. Um, but until it actually runs, until that line of code runs, this fault in the program isn't actually going to do anything bad. It isn't going to have any um, adverse effect. And therefore, this fault is an example of a latent fault. You know, nothing is happening until it gets triggered. And when it gets triggered, that latent fault might become an active fault. And the problem when a latent fault becomes an active fault is that um, when you run that line of code, you might have a mistake coming out at the output, um, which we're going to call an error. So when an active fault is exercised, it leads to an error. And the problem with errors is that if you're not careful about how you deal with errors, and most of what we're going to talk about is how to deal with errors, if you're not careful about how you deal with errors, that leads to a failure. So somewhat more formally, a fault is just any flaw in an underlying component or an underlying subsystem that your system is using. Now, if the fault um, turns out not to be exercised, then nothing, there's no error. There's no error that results, and there's no failure that results. It's only when you have an active fault um, that you might have an error, and when you have an error, you might have a failure. And what we're going to try to do is to understand how to um, deal with these errors. So when errors occur, we're going to try to hide them or mask them or do something such that uh, these errors don't propagate to cause failures. So the general goal, as I mentioned before, is to build um, systems that don't fail. And so in order to build systems that don't fail, um, there are two approaches at a 50,000-foot level. 
One approach to build a system that doesn't fail is to build it out of, make sure every system is going to be built out of components or modules, and those modules are going to be built out of modules themselves. One approach might be to make sure that no module ever fails, that no component that you use to build your bigger system ever fails. And it'll turn out that uh, for reasons that will become clear based on an understanding of the techniques we're going to employ to build systems that don't fail, uh, it'll turn out this is extremely expensive. It's just not going to work out for us to make sure that, you know, our disks never fail and memory never fails and, you know, our networks never fail and so on. It's just too expensive and um, um, nearly impossible. So what we're going to do actually is to start with unreliable components. And we're going to build reliable system out, systems out of unreliable components uh, or modules more generally. What this means is that the system that you build had better be tolerant of faults that these components, these underlying components have, which is why the design of systems that um, don't fail or rarely fail um, is essentially the same as designing systems that are tolerant of faults, hence fault tolerance. So that, that's the reason why we care about uh, fault tolerance. So let's take an example of, of the kinds of, uh, just to uh, crystallize these notions of faults and failures a little bit more. So let's say you have a big system that has a module, let's call it M1, and this module uses a couple of other modules, M2 and M3, and let's say M2 uses another module, M4, where users might be an invocation or, you know, imagine this is um, an RPC call, for example. And let's say that M4 in here has some component inside M4, like a disk or something, some piece of software in M4, and let's say that that fails. So it has a fault, it gets triggered, it becomes active, leads to an error, it actually fails, that little component. So when this fault becomes a failure, a couple of things could happen. M4, which, which is the module to which this little failure belongs, um, might do one of, can do one of two things. One possibility is that this fault that caused a failure gets exposed to the caller. So M4 can't actually, hasn't managed to figure out a way to hide this failure from, from M2, which means that the fault propagates up, the failure gets visible and the fault propagates up to M2. And now M2 actually sees um, the underlying component's uh, failure. Now the point here is that this little component uh, fault caused a failure here, which caused M4 itself to fail, because M4 now report couldn't hide this um, underlying failure and reported um, you know, something that was a failure, that was um, uh, an output that didn't conform to the specification of M4 out to M2. Now as far as M2 is concerned, all that has happened so far is that the failure of this module M4 has shown up as a fault to M2, right? Because an underlying module has failed, it doesn't mean that M2 has failed. It just means that M2 has now seen a fault. And M2 now might manage to hide this fault, which, meant, which would mean that M1 doesn't actually see anything. It doesn't see um, the underlying um, fault that caused failure at all. But of course, if M2 now couldn't hide this or couldn't mask this failure, then it would propagate um, an erroneous output out to M1, an output that didn't conform to the specification of M2, leading M1 to observe this as a fault, and so on. So the general idea is that um, failures of sub-modules tend to show up as faults in the higher level module. And our goal is to try to somehow design these systems that use lots of modules and components where um, at some level, we would, in the end, we would like to avoid failing overall. But inside here, um, we won't be able to go about making everything uh, failure free. I mean, there might, there might be failures inside sub-modules, but the idea is to ensure, or to try to ensure that M1 itself, the, the highest level system, doesn't fail. So let's start with a few examples. In fact, these are all examples of things that we've already seen, and we've, um, even though we haven't discussed it as such, we've seen a lot of examples of fault tolerance in uh, the class so far. So, um, for example, if you have um, bad synchronization code, like you didn't use the locking discipline properly or didn't use uh, um, any of the other synchronization property, um, primitives properly, you might have a software fault that leads to the failure of a module. 
Um, another example um, that we saw when we talked about networking is when we talked about routing, where the idea in here was that, you know, that we talked about routing protocols that could handle failures of links. So certain links could fail, leading to certain paths not being useful, usable, but the routing system managed to find other paths around the network. And that was because there were other paths available because the network itself was built with some degree of redundancy underneath, uh, and the routing protocol was able to uh, exploit that. Uh, another example uh, that we saw again from networks is packet loss. You know, we had best effort networks that would lose packets, and uh, it didn't mean that your actual transfer of a file at the end-to-end -end layer would miss data. You know, we came up with uh, retransmissions as a mechanism to um, use, again, another form of redundancy where you try the same thing again to get your data through. Um, another example of a failure um, that we saw was congestion collapse. where there was too much data being sent out into the network too fast and the network could collapse. And our solution to this problem was really to shed load, was to run the system slower than um, it otherwise would by having the people sending data send data slower um, in order to alleviate this problem. Another example which we saw last time was, uh, or briefly saw last time was the domain name system where domain name servers are replicated. So if you couldn't reach one to resolve your domain name, you could go to another one. And all of these, or most of these, actually are use the same techniques that we're going to talk about. And all of these techniques are built around some form of rep redundancy uh, or another, um, except probably the locking thing. But all of the others are built around some form of redundancy. Um, and we'll understand this more systematically um, today and in the next couple of classes. So our goal here is to develop a systematic approach. Uh, to building systems uh, that are fault tolerant. And the general approach for all fault tolerant systems is uh, to use three techniques. And the first one we've already seen, which is don't build a monolithic system, always build it around modules. And the reason is that it will turn out to be easier for us to isolate these modules, firstly one from another, but then when modules fail, it will be easier for us to treat those failures as faults and then try to hide, hide those faults and apply the same technique. Which brings us to the second step, which is when um, failures occur causing errors, um, we need a plan for the calling module, for the higher level module to detect errors. So failure results in an error, we gotta figure out a way to make sure, we have to know that it's happened, which means we need techniques to detect it. And of course, once we detect an error, we have a bunch of things we could do with it. But ideally, if you want to prevent a failure of that system, of a system that's observed errors, you need a way to hide these errors. Um, the jargon for this is mask errors. And if we do this, if we build systems that do this, then it's possible for us to build systems that conform to a spec. So the goal here is to try to make sure that systems conform to some specification. And if things don't conform to a specification, then that's when we call it a failure. And sometimes we'll play some tricks where in order to build systems that, um, you know, quote, never fail, um, we'll scale back the specification to actually allow for things that, you know, are, would in fact be considered failures, but are things that still would conform to the spec. So we'll, we'll relax the specification to make sure that we could still meet, um, you know, uh, the notion of a, a failure-free system or a fault-tolerant system. Um, and we'll see some examples of that uh, actually in the next uh, lecture. And the general trick I've already mentioned, the general trick uh, for all of these um, systems that we're going to study, examples that we're going to study, um, is to use some form of redundancy. And that's the way in which we're going to mask errors. And um, it al almost all systems, all, every system that I know of that's fault tolerant uses redundancy in some form or another, and often it's not obvious how it uses it, but it'll, it does actually use redundancy. So I'm going to now give an example that will turn out to be the same example we'll use for the next three or four lectures, and so you may as well, you know, you should probably get familiar with this example because we're going to see this over and over again. It's a really simple example, but it'll, it, it's complicated enough that everything uh, we want to learn about fault tolerance will 
be visible in this example. So it starts with a person who wants to do a bank transaction uh, at an ATM or a PC or, or on a computer. Um, you want to do a bank transaction. And the way this works, as you, as you probably know, is it goes over some kind of a network. Um, and then, you know, if you want to do this uh, a bank um, transaction, it goes to a server, which is, usually, which is run by your bank. And the way this normally works is that the server has um, a module that it uses, uh, a database system, which deals with managing, uh, you know, your account information. And because you don't want to forget, and the bank shouldn't forget how much money you have, uh, there's data that's stored on disk. And we're going to be doing things that are on um, actions of the following form. We're going to be asking to uh, transfer, you know, from some account to another account some amount of money. And now, of course, anything could fail in between. So, for example, um, there could be a problem in the network, and the network could fail, or the software running on the server could fail, or the software running in this database system could, you know, s could crash, or you know, report bad values, or something, the disk could fail. And we want systematic techniques by which um, this transfer here, or all these, you know, these calls that look a lot like transfer, do the right thing. And so this doing the right thing is actually what is an informal way of saying meet a specification. So we first have to decide what we want for a specification um, that has to hold true no matter what happens, no matter what failures occur. So one example of a specification might be to say, no matter what happens, if I invoke this and it returns, then this, much amount, this, am this amount of money has to be transferred from here to here. So that could be a specification that you might expect. Um, it also turns out that specification is extremely hard to meet, and we're not even going to try to do it. And this is the weasel wording I said before about we'll modify the specification. So we'll change the specification going forward for this example to mean if this call returns, then no matter what failures occur, either a transfer has happened exactly once, or the state of the system is as if the transfer didn't even get started. Okay? Which is reasonable. I mean, you, and then, um, you know, if you really care about moving the money and you determine that it hasn't been moved, you or some program might try it again, which actually is another form of using redundancy where you just try it over again. Um, and the reason, and you won't understand, we won't understand completely why um, a specification that says you have to do this exactly once if it returns, it, why that's hard to implement, why that's hard to achieve, uh, we'll see that in the next couple of classes. So for now, just realize that the specification here is it should happen exactly once, or it should be as if it didn't even, it didn't even you know, not, no partial action corresponding to the internals of this transfer happened. So the state of the system must be as if um, the system never saw this transfer request. So any module could fail here. So let's take some examples of failures in order to get some terminology um, that will help us understand faults. So one thing that could happen is that you could have a disk failure. So the disk could just fail. And um, one example of a disk failure is the disk fails and then it just stops working and it tells the database system that's trying to read and write data from it that it isn't working. So if that kind of failure happens where, it just, where this module here, or this component just completely stops and tells the higher level module that it stopped, uh, that's an example of a failure that's called a fail-stop failure. And more generally, any module that tells the higher level module that it's just stopped working uh, without reporting anything else, uh, no outputs, that's fail-stop. Because you could have disks, and most disks today, you might have failures that aren't fail stop. You might have something where um, there's some kind of error checking associated with every sector on your disk, and disk might start reporting um, errors that say that this is a bad sector. So it doesn't fail stop, but it tells the higher level, the database system in this case, that some data that's it's read or data that's been um, written, ha there's a bad sector, which means that the checksum doesn't match um, the data that's being read. When you have an error like that, where um, it doesn't stop working, but it tells you that something bad is going on, that's an example of a failure that's called a fail-fast failure. I actually don't think these terms are, most of these terms are particularly important. Fail-stop is usually 
important and worth knowing. But the reason to go through these terms is more that more to understand that there are various kinds of failures possible. So one case it stops working, in another case it just tells you that it's not working but continues working. It tells you that certain uh, operations are not uh, haven't been correctly done. Now another thing that could happen when, for example, the disk has you know has fail stopped uh, has fail is failing uh, fail fast is that the database system might decide that. Um, write operations, it doesn't really, you're not allowed to write things to disk because the disk is, um, you know, either failed completely or has failed fast, but it might allow read-only uh, actions or requests that are read-only. So for example, it might allow users to come to an ATM machine and just read how much money they have from their account because it might be that there's a cache um, of the data that's in memory in the database. So it might allow read-only actions, um, in which case the system's perform is, is functioning um, with only a subset of the actions that it's supposed to be taking. And if that happens, that kind of failure is called a fail soft failure. Where uh, it doesn't, you know, not all of the interfaces are available, but a subset of the interfaces are available and correctly working. And the last kind of failure that could happen is that, uh, for example, in this, in this, uh, in this example, um, Let's say that failures are occurring when there's a large number of people trying to do, make these requests at, at ATMs. And there's some problems that, um, you know, there's some problems that have arisen and the, somebody determines that the problem arises when there's too many people uh, gaining access to the system at the same time. And the system might now move to a mode where it allows only a small number of actions at a time, a small number of concurrent actions at a time, or maybe one action at a time. So one user can come at a time to the system, which means the system's, uh, there, is, there has been a failure, but the way the system's dealing with it is that it determines that the failure doesn't get triggered when, um, you know, the load is low. So it might function at low performance. Um, it still provides all of the interfaces, but just at very low performance uh, or at lower performance. And that kind of behavior is called fail safe. So it's moved to a mode where um, it's just scaled back how much work it's willing to do um, and does it at degraded performance. All right. Okay. So the plan now is for the rest of today, so from tomorrow, or from next lecture on, what we're going to do is understand the algorithms for how we go about and how you build systems um, that actually do one or all of these in order to meet the specification that we want. Um, but before we do that, we have to understand a little bit about um, models for faults. In order to build fault-tolerant systems, it's usually a good idea to understand um, You know, a little bit more quantitatively models um, of faults that occur in systems. And primarily this discussion is going to be focused on um, hardware faults because most people don't understand how software faults are, are to be modeled. But since all our systems are going to be built on hardware, typically, for example, disks are going to be really common or network links are going to be common, and all of those conform nicely to models, uh, it's worth understanding how that works. So for example, um, you know, a disk manufacturer might report that the error rate of undetected errors. So disks usually have a fair amount of error detection in them, but they might report that the, the error rate of undetected errors is say 10 to the minus 12th or 10 to the minus 13th. And that number looks really small. That says that you know, out of that many bits, maybe one bit is corrupted uh, and you can't detect it. But you have to realize that given modern workloads, for example, take Google as an example um, that you saw from last uh, recitation, the amount of data that's being stored in a system like that or you know, the world in general, um, is so huge that a 10 to the minus 13th error rate means that you're probably seeing some bad data in file that you can never fix or never detect um, you know, every couple of days. Um, or you know, network people would tell you that uh, optic, fiber optic links have an error rate of one error in 10 to the 12th. But you have to realize that these links are sending so many gigabits per second that one error in 10 to the 12th means something like there's an error that you can't detect um, maybe you know, every couple of hours, 
What that really means is that at the higher layers, you need to do more work in order to make sure that your data is protected, um, because you can't actually rely on the fact that your underlying components have these amazingly low numbers, because there's so much data going on um, being sent or being stored on these systems that you need to have other techniques at a higher layer to protect um, if you really care about the integrity of your data. Um, in addition to these raw numbers, um, there's two uh, or three other metrics that people use um, to understand uh, faults. The first one, or, and failures. The first one is the number of tolerated failures. So for example, if you build um, a system to store data and you're, you're worried about disks failing or disks reporting erroneous values, you might replicate that data across many, many disks. And then when you design your system, one of the things you would want to analyze and report is the number of tolerated failures of disks. So for example, if you build a system out of you know, uh, seven disks, you might say that you can handle up to two, two failed disks, something like that, depending on how you've des designed your system. And that's usually uh, a good thing to report because then people who use your system can know how to provision or engineer um, their system, uh, the, um, your system. The second uh, metric, which we're gonna spend a few more minutes on, is something called mean time to failure. And what this says is it takes a model where you have a system that starts at time zero and it's running fine, and then at some point in time it fails. And then when it fails, somebody, you know, that, error, that failure is made known to an operator or it's made known to some higher level that has a plan to work around it to repair this failure. And then once the failure gets repaired, it takes some time for the failure to get repaired, and once it gets repaired, it starts running again, and then it fails at some other point in the future. And when it goes through the cycle of failures and repairs, you end up with a timeline that looks like this. So you might start at time zero, um, and the system's working fine, and then there's a failure that happens here, and then the system's down for a certain period of time, and then somebody repairs the system, and then it continues to work, and then it fails again, and so on. And so for each of the durations of time that the system's working, it's, let's assume it's starting at zero, each of these defines a period of time that I'm gonna call TTF, or time to fail. Okay, so this is the first time to fail um, interval. This is the second time to fail. This is the second time to fail interval, and then this is a time to repair, and this is the third time to fail interval, and so on. And analogously, in between here, I could define these time to repair intervals, TTR1, TTR2, and so on. So the mean time to failure is just the mean of these values. There's some duration of time here, like three hours, the system worked, and then it um, crashed. Um, that's TTF1, and then it, somebody repaired it, it worked now for six hours, that's TTF2 and so on. If you take, run your system for a long enough period of time, um, like a disk or anything else, and then you observe all these time to fail samples, that tells you, and take the mean of that, that tells you a mean time to failure. Now the reason this is interesting is that you could use, you could run your system for a really long period of time uh, and build up a metric called availability. So for example, if you're running a, a website, um, and you know, the way this website works is everyone, it runs for a while, and then every once in a while it crashes, or its network crashes, and people can't get to you. So you could run this for months or years on end, and then observe these values, and then um, you, know, you could run this every month, you could decide what the availability is, and decide if it's good enough, or if you want to make it higher or lower. So you can now define your availability to be the total amount, the fraction of time that your system is up and running. The fraction of time that the system's up and running is the fraction of time on this timeline that you have the, uh, um, this, uh, this kind of shaded thing. Okay, so that's just equal to the sum of all of the time to failure numbers divided by the total time. And the total time is just uh, you know, the sum of all the TTFs and the TTRs. 
And that's, that's what availability means. It's the fraction of time that your system is available is up. Now, if you divide both the top and the bottom by n, um, this number works out to be the mean time to failure divided by divided by the mean time to failure plus the mean time to repair. So this is a useful notion because now it tells you that you, you can watch your system for a really long period of time and build up a mean estimate of mean, of mean values of the time to failure and the time to repair and um, you know, just come up with the notion of what the availability of the system is and then decide based on whether it's high enough or not um, whether you want to improve some aspect of the system and whether it's worth doing. So it turns out this mean time to failure um, and therefore availability is related for, compon for uh, components to uh, a notion called the failure rate. So let me define the failure rate in a second. So the failure rate um, is defined as, it's also called a hazard function. That's why people use the term H of T, the hazard rate. That's defined as the probability that you have a failure of a system or a component in time T to T plus delta T, given that it's working, I'm going to say, OK, at time T. So it's a conditional probability. It's a, it's a probability that you fail in the next time instant, given that it's correctly working and has been correctly working. It's correctly working at time t. So if you look at this for a disk, um, most disks look like uh, the picture shown up here. This is also called the bathtub curve, because it looks like a bathtub. What you see at the left end here are new disks. So the x-axis here shows time. I I guess it's a little shifted below. You can't read some stuff that's written at the bottom. But the x-axis shows time, and the y-axis shows the failure rate. So when you take a new component, like a new light bulb or a new disk and anything new, um, there's a pretty high chance that it'll actually fail. This is why if you buy, you know, manuf manufacturers, when they sell you stuff, don't actually sell you uh, things without actually burning them in first. Yeah, so for semiconductors, that's also called yield. They make a whole number of, large number of chips, and then they burn in a few, and then they only give you the rest. And the stuff that's, you know, survived the burn-in is, is the fraction that survives the burn-in is also called the yield. So what you see on the left, uh, the colorful term for that is also uh, infant mortality. So it's, you know, the things that die when they're really, really young. And then once you get past that early mortality period, you end up with a uh, flat failure, a conditional probability for failure. And what this says is that, um, and I'll get to this in a little bit, but what this says is that, once you're in the flat region, it says that the probability of failure is, is essentially independent of what's happened in the past. And then what, you, you stay here for a while, and then if the system has been operating, like a disk has been operating for a while, let's say three years or five years typically for disks, then the probability of failure starts going up again because that's usual, usually due to wear and tear, which, which for hardware components is certainly uh, the case. There are a couple of interesting things about um, this curve that you should um, realize, particularly when you read specifications for things like disks. Disk manufacturers will report a number, uh, uh, like a mean time to failure number. And the mean, mean time to failure number that they report might usually, I mean, for disks, might be 200,000 hours or 300,000 hours. I mean, that's a really long period of time. That's 30 years. So when you look at a number like that, you have to ask whether what it means is that disks really survive 30 years. And if you've you know, anybody who's owned a computer knows that their disk, you know, has never, you know, most disks don't survive 30 years. So they're actually reporting one over the reciprocal of this thing at the flat region of the curve because this conditional failure probability rate at the normal, at this operation time when the only reason things fail is completely random failures, not related to wear and tear. So when disk manufacturers report a mean time to failure number, um, they're actually reporting something that isn't, it isn't that that's the time that your disk is going to like, is likely to work. What that number really says is that it, during the period of time that the disk is normally working, the probability of a random failure is one over the mean time to failure. 
So that's what it really says. So the other number that they also report, um, often in smaller print, is the expected operational lifetime. And that's usually something like three years or four years or five years, uh, whatever it is they report. And that's where this thing starts going up and get beyond a point where the probability of failure is above some threshold, they report that as the expected operational lifetime. Now, for software, this curve doesn't actually apply because, or at least nobody really knows what the curve is for software. Um, what is true for software, though, is infant mortality, things where the, the conditional probability of failure is high for new software, which is why you know, you're sort of well advised not to, you know, the moment a new upgrade of something comes around, you know, most people who are prudent wait a little bit to just make sure that all the bugs are ironed out and things get a little bit stable. So they wait a few months. You're always a couple of revisions behind. So I, I, I do believe that for software, the left side of the curve holds. Uh, it's totally unclear that there is a flat region, and it's totally unclear that things start rising again um, with, um, with, uh, with age. So the reason for this curve um, being the way it is is um, a lot of this is based on the fact that things are mechanical and have wear and tear. But the motivation for this kind of curve actually comes from demographics and from human um, lifespans. So this is a picture that I got from um, it's a website called mortality.org, which, uh, 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 which, is, which is a research project uh, run by demographers, and they have amazing data. There's w way more data available about human life expectancy and demographics than anything about software. Uh, what this shows here is actually the same bathtub curve as in the previous chart. It just doesn't look like that because the, the y-axis is on a log scale. So given that the, you know, it's rising linearly between 0.001 and 0.01, uh, on a linear scale, that looks essentially flat. So human beings, for uh, you know, the probability of death given at a certain time, given that you're alive at a certain time, um, that follows this curve here, essentially a bathtub curve. Um, at the left end, of course, there's infant mortality. This, I think, I pulled the data down. This is from an article that appeared where the data is for the U.S. population in 1999. Uh, it starts off again with infant mortality, and then it's flat for a while, and then it rises up. Um, now, there's a lot of controversy, it turns out, for whether you know, the bathtub curve at the right end holds for human beings or not. And some people believe it does, and some people believe it doesn't. But the point here is that for human beings anyway, the rule of thumb that insurance companies use is for determining you know, insurance premiums is that the um, log of the death rate, the log of the probability of dying at a certain age, um, is linear, grows linearly uh, with um, the time that somebody's been alive. And that's what this graph shows, that on a log scale on the y-axis, you have a line. And that's what they use for determining um, insurance premiums. OK, so th the reason this bathtub curve is actually useful is, so if you go back, let's go back here. The reason both these numbers are useful, the flat portion of the bathtub curve and the expected operational lifetime, is the following. It's not like this flat portion of the curve where the disk manufacturer reports a mean time to failure that's 30 years. It's not like that's useless, um, even though your disk only might run for three to four years. The reason is that if you have a project, if you have a system where you're willing to upgrade your disk every three years, where you've budgeted for upgrading your disks every, say, three years, then you might be better off buying a disk whose expected lifetime is only five years, but whose flat portion is really low. So in particular, if you're given um, two disks, one of which has a curve that looks like that, and another that has a curve that looks like that, and let's say this is you know, five years, and this is three, year, uh, this is three years, if you're, pro if you're building a system and you've budgeted for upgrading your disks every four years, then you're probably better off using the thing with the, higher, uh, with the lower value of mean time to failure because its expected lifetime is longer. But if you're willing to upgrade your disks every two years or one year, then you might be better off with this thing here with the lower mean time to failure even though its expected operational lifetime is smaller. So both these numbers are actually meaningful, and it depends a lot on how you're planning to use it. I mean, it's a lot like spare tires on your car. I mean, the spare tire will run perfectly fine as long as you don't exceed 100 miles. And the moment you exceed 100 miles, then you don't want to use it at all. And it might be a lot cheaper to build a spare tire that runs just 100 miles because the use is you're guaranteed that you'll get to a, you know, a repair shop within 100 miles. It's the same concept. 
Okay. So one of the things that we can define once we have this conditional failure rate is the reliability of a system. And we'll define that as the probability, R of t, is the probability that the system is working at time t um, given that it was working at time zero. Or more generally, that, you know, assuming that everything is always working at time zero, it's the probability that you're OK at time t. And it turns out that for components in the flat region of this curve where the H of t, the conditional failure rate, is a constant, on systems that satisfy that and which satisfy the property that the actual unconditional failure rate is a memoryless process where the probability of failure doesn't depend on how long the system has been running, it turns out for the systems that satisfy those conditions, um, which apparently disks do in, the, in, you know, in their operation when they're actually not at the right edge of the curve, which disks do, the reliability is um, this function goes as a very nice simple function, which is an exponential decaying function, e to the minus t over mttf. And this is under two conditions. H of t has to be flat, and the unconditional failure rate has to be something that doesn't depend on how long the system's been running. And for those systems, um, it's not hard to show that your reliability is just an exponential decaying function, which means you can do a lot of things like predict how long uh, the system is likely to be running and so on. And that will tell you, you know, when to upgrade things. Okay. So given all of this stuff, we now want techniques to cope with failures, cope with faults. And that's what we're going to be looking at um, for the next few lectures. Um, let's take one simple example of a system first. And like I said before, all of these systems use redundancy in some form. So, you know, the disk fails at a certain rate, just put in multiple disks, replicate the data across them, and then hope that things survive. So the first kind of redundancy that you might have is, is in the example that I just talked about, is spatial, redund re spatial redundancy where the idea is that um, you, know, you have multiple copies of the same thing, and the games we're going to play all have to do with how we're going to manage all these copies. And actually, this will turn out to be um, quite complicated. We'll use these spatial copies in a number of different ways. Um, in some examples, we'll apply error-correcting codes to um, you know, make copies of the data or other, use other codes to replicate the data. Um, we might replicate data and make copies of data in the form of logs, which keep track of, you know, you run an operation, you store some results, but at the same time, before you store those results, you also store um, something in a log, so if the original data went away, your log can tell you what to do. Uh, or you might just do plain and simple um, copies followed by uh, voting. So the idea is that you run multiple, ver you know, you have multiple copies of something, and then, you know, you write to all of them. In the simplest of schemes, you might write to all of them. And then when you want to read something, you read from all of them and then just vote and go with the majority. So intuitively, that can tolerate a certain number of failures. So, and all of these approaches have been used, and people will, con have continue, will continue to build systems along all of these ideas. But in addition, uh, we're also going to look at temporal redundancy. And the idea here is um, try it again. So this is different from copies. Uh, what it says is you, you try something. If it doesn't work and you determine that it doesn't work, try it again. So retry is an example of temporal uh, tricks. But it'll turn out we'll also use not just moving forward and retrying something that we know should be retried. We'll also use the trick of undoing things that we have done. So we'll move both directions on the time axis. We'll retry stuff, but at the same time, we'll also undo things, because sometimes uh, things have happened that shouldn't have happened. You know, things went halfway, and we really want to back things out. And we're going to use um, both of these techniques. So one example of spatial redundancy is a voting scheme. <clears throat> 
And you know, you can apply this to uh, a bunch of di many different kinds of systems, but let's just apply it to a simple example of, you know, there's data stored in multiple locations, and then, um, you know, whenever data is written, it's written to all of them, and then when you read it, you read from all of them, and then you vote. And in a simple model where these components are fail stop, which means if they fail, they just um, fail. Well, excuse me. On a simple model where these um, uh, things are not, not fail stop or fail, fail fast, but just report bad d data to you. So you know, you're voting on it, and these results come back. You've written something, and then when you read things back, arbitrary values might get returned if there's a failure. And if there's no failure here, correct values get returned. Then as long as two of these copies are correctly working, or two of these versions are correctly working, then the vote will actually return to you the correct output. And that's the idea behind voting. So if the reliability of each of these components is some, some r, that's the probability that the system is working at time t, according to that definition of reliability, then under the assumption that these are completely independent of each other, which is a big assumption, particularly for software, but might be a reasonable assumption for uh, something like a disk, under the assumption that these are completely independent, then you could write out the reliability of this three voting scheme, of this thing where you're voting on three outputs. But you know that the system is correctly working if any two of these are correctly working. So that happens under two conditions. Firstly, all three are correctly working. Right? Or some two of the three are correctly working, and there's three ways in which you could choose some two of the three. And one of them is wrongly working. And it turns out that this number actually is very, very large, much larger than R uh, when, as, when R is uh, close to one. And in general, this is bigger than R uh, when each of the components um, has high enough reliability, namely bigger than half. And so, you know, let's say that each of these components has a failure, uh, has a re reliability of 95%. If you work this number out, it turns out to be a pretty big number, much higher than 95%, much closer to one. Of course, you know, this kind of voting is a bad idea if the reliability of these components is really low. If it's below one half, then chances are that, you know, you're more likely that two of them are just wrong and you agree on that result and it turns out to reduce the reliability of the system. Now, in general, you might think that you can build systems out of this basic voting idea, and it, um, for various reasons, turns out that this idea has limited applicability for the kinds of things we want to do. And a lot of that stems from the fact that these are not, in general, in computer systems, it's very hard to design components that are completely independent of each other. It might work out okay for certain hardware components, um, where you might do this voting or you know, other forms of spatial redundancy. Uh, that gives you these impressive reliability uh, numbers. But for software, independ this independence assumption turns out to be really hard to meet. And there is an approach to building software like this. It's called n-version programming, and it's, it's still a topic of research where people try to build systems, software systems, um, out of voting. Um, but you have to pay a lot of attention and care to make sure that these software components these, that are doing the same function are actually independent. Um, maybe written by different people, different, running on different operating systems, and so on. And that turns out to be a pretty expensive undertaking. You know, still sometimes necessary if you want to build something highly reliable, but um, because of its cost, it's not something that is the sort of cookie-cutter te cookie technique for achieving highly reliable software systems. And so what we're going to see starting from next time is a somewhat different approach for achieving software reliability that doesn't rely on voting which won't actually achieve the same degree of reliability as these kinds of systems, um, but will achieve a different kind of reliability that we'll talk about starting from next time. <laughs>